Welcome to the Lubbers Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You are with Ian and with Mike, and together we're rereading the Aubrey Matron novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, bit of a different take on this week's episode. Help us figure out where we are and what we're up to this week. Yeah, we are a bit of a different take. Ian, this week we're going to take a pause to welcome a special guest. Since we're just at that point in the canon where Stephen Matron's intelligence role was starting to become clearer, what better time to talk to someone who knows more about naval intelligence at that era than anybody we've met so far? We're joined by Steve Maffeo, author of the book Most Secret and Confidential, Intelligence in the Age of Nelson. Awesome. We're really looking forward to talking to Steve about the world of naval intelligence, its portrayal in the O'Brien canon, the connection to Lord Nelson, and also a sneaky look ahead at the events that are coming up in the closing chapters of Post Captain. Awesome. Perfect timing, Mike. Let's get into it. I can't wait. We're really excited to welcome to the show today our special guest, Steve Maffeo. We know Steve most immediately, most kind of adjacently, as the author of a really fascinating book, Most Secret and Confidential Intelligence in the Age of Nelson. And that's where we're going to be headed with the conversation today. Um, Steve's resume is super fascinating. Uh, He recently retired as Associate Library Director at the United States Air Force Academy, where he'd been in post for 26 years, and had also had time prior to that as a reference librarian at the Academy. Steve began with a civilian career, which we'll hear some more about, but uh, included time as a library administrator, Uh, And he spent 30 years, both enlisted and commissioned, in the U.S. Navy, in the Colorado Army National Guard, and the U.S. Naval Reserve. He had professional assignments with many outfits, including commanding officer, Office of Naval Intelligence Reserve Units in Salt Lake City and in Denver, and was course director for the National Defense Intelligence College's special course on the history of defense intelligence. Steve, this makes you super well qualified, I think, to talk to us about intelligence and the world of Steve and Matrin. Welcome to the show. Ian and Mike, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. So, Steve, tell us a bit about your career and how you came to be involved in the field of naval intelligence. Well, I, for some strange reason, for a kid who grew up in Colorado, I always had a fascination with the Navy and particularly the Age of Sail. I don't know why. My parents Mm. took me to see the Marlon Brando, Trevor Howard movie of uh, Mutiny on the Bounty when I was uh, eight years old. And that that impressed me quite a bit. And uh, my mother bought me beautiful hardbound book of Captain Horatio Hornblower with that with that great N. C. Wyeth dust jacket. I know it. Yeah, I know it. Which I still have, and I have a Good. whole poster of that, of that just down the hall from me here. <laughs> Very of cool. That. And uh, that it was a little hard to read in the fourth grade, but I, I struggled through it. So you know, and then I read the Hornblower. I read uh, Kent's Belitho series. I read Pope's Ramage series, and 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 some bits and pieces here and and there. And uh, I just had that in mind and was interested in in uh, in all things naval. And uh, so I decided, well, maybe I could go to the Naval Academy, and uh, I applied for that, and also for an ROTC scholarship. I had a an eye issue, and I wasn't sure I could get in, but I did get into the Naval Academy. Oh. But I found out a year and a half later that they were going to restrict me to the Supply Corps because of my eye issue, and they had never bothered to tell me that. You know how bureaucracy is. Oh. And uh, and I got mad, and I quit. And uh, came back to Colorado and uh, got my bachelor's degree in English literature. Huh? How do you like that? Nice. And uh, from the University of Colorado. And then I went straight into library science as a master's degree at the University of Denver. And then about that time, I had calmed down a little bit. And I went down to the recruiters and I said, well, OK, what? They said, well, yeah, the problem you had is no longer a problem for us. So you could you could come back in and do whatever. And uh 
they wanted me to fly. And the only reason they wanted me to fly, not as a pilot, <laughs> is uh, is uh, that's what they were short on. See, that's how recruiters are. Whatever they're short yeah, on, that's right. That's, that's the I only need. thing they'll tell you about. Uh, but they did say, but you know, uh, if you wanted to go into the reserves, the moving headquarters for the Naval Reserve Intelligence Command happens to be in Denver, right? Well, you should maybe go talk to those guys. Oh, wow. So okay. I did. And um, and uh, I would have had to enlist uh, as an intelligence specialist, but but uh, too hard to explain with, with the bureaucracy of the system. Um, I, I had to be 26 before I could do that, and I wasn't. So I joined the Colorado Army National Guard in the Signal Corps as an enlisted okay. guy. And... Uh, did that for a year, and then uh, then I turned 26, and so then I switched over and joined the Naval Reserves Intelligence Specialist third class, and so I did that for a couple of years. I moved it, it was a civilian job to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, I was able to apply for and obtain a direct commission in Naval Intelligence based on the background that I had and based on the fact that I had gotten a security clearance and uh, that I had a master's degree in library science, which has some parallels to what you do in intelligence. Right. right. And so I did that. And then I did various bits of active duty operations, active duty training. Um, but I basically stayed a reservist for 30 years um, and came up through the ranks. I commanded three different shore-based intelligence units, two of which were joint units, as well as his naval reserve ones. And, uh, Ended up a captain. You can see behind me. Oops, I guess uh, the, <laughs> we can. <laughs> you yeah. can. You can. You can see uh, that I had uh, a pretty good career and got yeah. Wow, that's, uh, some that's quite, quite and quite a solid bar there, Steve. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. And I'm I'm proud of all that. But that's how I got into that. And I guess the 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 thing that's going to become real relevant here is that. Uh, I also in the in the Navy had an opportunity to go to the Joint Military Intelligence College in Washington D.C. and got a master's degree in strategic intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I figured that the thesis would probably have to be something current, but found out that no, they would they would consider historical ones. And so I had this interest in the age of sail, uh -huh. and I had this interest in intelligence. And they were going to let me do a historical one. So I decided, well, what in the world was secret intelligence nationally, internationally, back in 1800, so we say? And what was naval intelligence as a subset of that back in those days? And that's, that's what my thesis became. And as I was writing it, I realized that there was no book on the subject. There was bits and pieces everywhere, here and there and everywhere. And uh, so I wrote an obscenely long thesis, <laughs> 300 pages, where, where wow. 90 pages would have done, yep. and, uh, and with the idea that maybe I could turn this into a book later. And uh, and that's that's what happened. I, I did a pretty thorough rewrite of it to turn it into a book. But, wow. Uh, that's that's how Most Secret and Confidential came came out of, uh, of that. So it was, it was really great because I got to do two thousand you know, interested in intelligence things, and I still am. Um, I've got a million books on intelligence, all all periods. Yeah. Um, and uh, I later on taught at the Joint Military Intelligence College. I became the course director for three years of the history of intelligence yeah. and, and taught that. And so, I mean, this is something that I'm really interested in. And so being able to, to write this book uh, on my favorite time period, Nice. Uh, and folding that in is, is how that came to pass. Um, so they're, they're that pretty much it. And did you get to travel any place for primary sources, for digging into archives and stuff? I'm thinking, like, did you get to Greenwich? Did you get to any of those kind of locations? You know, I didn't because, again, I was, uh, well, at the time I was writing the thesis, there, that wasn't going to be possible just right. job-wise and time-wise and, yeah. and, uh, and all that kind of thing. And I had a brand new little baby boy to help my wife with and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but again, I was, I was, um, I was doing a popular history, yeah. so to speak, Yeah. but so much good stuff has been published. Right. And so right. I borrowed through interlibrary loan, uh, oh, maybe a hundred items 
Plus, I was working at the U.S. Air Force Academy Library at that point full time, and uh, their collection on, on military history and on intelligence was pretty prodigious. And so uh, I, I didn't feel the need. And, and so that's why one or two reviewers of the book initially were saying, well, the definitive work remains to be done. And the definitive work would have been going through archival work in London and, and Fort Smith and, and elsewhere. And I, I did not do that. But then again, neither has anybody else, as we talked about. Yep. So there it is. There Fantastic. It is. Steve, you, you mentioned a lot of the books that you read in your youth. I was curious, when did you first come across the Patrick O'Brien books? Pretty late in the game, and, and I can't really explain that uh, other than I got busy with life and work right. and, and, and whatnot. And uh, uh, I mean, I can explain when I, 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 I found them at the end of 1993, Um which is pretty late in the game, you know, relative to, to all this other stuff that I read. And I don't right. know what, what caused that, but uh, I, I started reading those in January of 94 and and was immediately hooked and uh, in charge through them. And, you know, Master and Commander doesn't deal with intelligence. Right, right. Pretty much at all. No. Um, but it was still, you know, it was still in my area of, of, of interest. You know, Forrester in, in, in Horatio Hornblower touches upon it here and yeah. there. I mean, Indeed. all of these guys touch them. It, you have to. I mean, I mean, you can't, uh, having been the course director of the uh, history of intelligence, you, you got to realize that organized national and military intelligence goes back, you know, to the ancients. Right. Um, the Romans were very sophisticated with it, for, in particular. And so it's uh, the joke is it's the second oldest profession, right? <laughs> um, and, and so uh, you know there you go. But uh, <laughs> it, you know it all stems on that, and you go forward from that. So I still was interested in in uh, in uh, the characters. I was interested in the detail and the depth uh, of of O'Brien. And then when he started talking about matters of intelligence, that was that was uh, even more of interest to me. So as you very well know. In my yeah. book, I I make references to right uh, fictional things, and I've been very disappointed in, in in a couple reviewers who think that I think that fictional citations are as good as real ones because I don't think that. Right. And, right. and I thought I was plenty clear in <laughs> in the book saying fictional, but but some of the things. Were, were 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 fun to throw in some of the right. remarks that some of the characters were fun to throw in and and yeah. and, and basically i wrote that book for guys like you and me yeah who who uh are interested in that time period and who read these kinds of series o'brien clearly worked really really hard to get close to his sources and to what we know about the, the the truth of life and naval operations and stuff in the era. There are lots of people who I'm sure have learned, probably me included, like 90% of what I think I know about the Nelsonian era Navy has come from reading O'Brien and reading a little bit of what lay behind it. And are there any risks there in, in, in what O'Brien chose to write and how he chose to write about it that we might get, we might get seduced into thinking he's a primary source? Yes, <laughs> there are. Um, and there are risks specific to his discussions of, of how intelligence operations were. And there are some risks in terms of some of the other things that he says. I certainly don't want to criticize him because he, he's a genius. Yeah. But he reminds me a little bit of James Michener, mm. who I think also was a genius. But he was a superb historian, superb historian. Um, and, they re and they recount a lot of fabulous, genuine, true historical stuff, but they also make stuff up when they want to. Right. <laughs> and they and they meld it all together. And there's no way, unless you're you're pretty well read yourself, that sometimes you can differentiate. So Centennial is is not the definitive history of the state of Colorado from James Mitchell's point of view. <laughs> nor is Hawaii same thing. And you got to be a little careful with, with Patrick O'Brien in, yeah. in terms of, of uh, some of the technical stuff that he talks about. And you, you've got to be a little careful of, of the intelligence stuff. His whole notion of an established 
intelligence department in the Royal Navy. It, it, it wasn't. There wasn't. In fact, I need to, I, I'm going to read a, a thing here that right. I think, and it's brief. When Charles Middleton, who became uh, Lord Barham, yep. uh, first Lord of the Admiralty in May of 1805, he wrote that he found there is no method whatever observed in arranging or collecting information, which is of utmost consequence on the judging of enemy intentions. No time ought to be lost in adopting some plan for this purpose. So this is May 1805. Now, I would tell you, he had some legitimate concerns. He did. Yeah. But he also exaggerated the point. I mean, stuff was happening. People were handling intelligence information. Uh, but 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 his point is well taken. There, but there was no department. There was no real organized thing. Basically, what was happening in terms of intelligence in the Royal Navy was pretty much at the interest of the First Lord, or yeah. lack of interest, right. and the interest of the First Secretary, or lack of. And it, it was a roller coaster in both cases. Uh, there were First Lords who were terribly interested in, in, in information, and there were First Secretaries. You know, all departments in the, in, the, in the British government in those days were involved in intelligence. It, it wasn't a separate thing. The business yeah. of the government was was grabbing on to information and trying to use that to their great effect. Um, and this goes back to centuries. The intelligence uh, services are 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 working hard, and the code breaking systems are 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 working diligently. Uh, he had a total change of of, of heart there. But yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, Lord Nelson didn't have this. Right. Problem. No, no at such all. compunction. <laughs> Not at all, and 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 neither did a lot of other folks. The captured mail was ruthlessly uh, opened and and looked at, and then yeah. um, and I get you know one of the things we've got to talk about. Do you want me to talk about it right now? Is the post sure. office? Yeah, let's do. Um, it, it, as I said, most departments of the of the British government, and I would say probably of European governments. Uh, in parallel, were yeah. concerned with with uh, what they could gain from grabbing as much information as they could and, and turning it into something. Of course, the big thing that you have to talk about is the technology was low, and communications were relatively primitive. You're, you're not in much better shape than the Romans were. You know, you're going to be right. moving information um, that's written down, oftentimes uh, by hand. Uh, ho hopefully with penmanship that can be read, and somebody's going to carry it by horse, they're going to carry it on on uh, stagecoaches and carriages or here and there and everywhere. If you're going to move it across the water, you're going to put it in boats, and so information transmission is, is going to be slow and, and, and sporadic, but there still was this interest, there still was some parts that were going to be uh, organized in doing this. So, uh -huh. you know, it's really fair to say at the end of the 18th century, uh, most Western countries had created diplomatic information systems. They developed cryptography and cryptanalysis. Yeah. They've established networks of spies. They've arranged for clandestine mail interception and opening. And they've built infrastructures to record, distribute, and file the resulting information. Wow. And subject to that roller coaster that, that we've yeah, talked right. about already. Right. The, the mass of information contained degrees of sensitive material or secret intelligence. That said, secret intelligence was really not differentiated from other information. And essentially, most governments essentially regarded all information as their property. But let's talk about the post office, because uh, His Majesty's post office was big time in this thing. The 18th century British post office probably was the most important in terms of collecting, processing, finishing, and transmitting intelligence information both in great britain and then around the world they've got a system of moving right. information i mean just to move the mail yeah. and then right. it's not that hard to slide into uh what, what else can you do with, with it besides mail? gathering <laughs> yeah exactly so i mean but you've even got you've got packet ships that are moving it or mail around the world and right and uh you know all sorts of things that were already sort of in place and so it wasn't a stretch to get postal agents 
to gather information. It wasn't a stretch to get captains of packet vessels to supply extra information in terms of shipping news and lists of passengers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but <laughs> they also, the post office, and, and this this was codified several times legally over over many years, were given the authority, the legal authority. Um, I mean, this is not publicly widely known that they were doing mm -hmm. this, but it was legal because the parliament had had passed some acts that that operated that, particularly the Post Office Act of 1711, uh, gave uh, a huge authorization to do this kind of stuff and to open mail. Right. And so everybody knew wow. that you didn't trust every 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 nationality. You know, you knew that the mail wasn't safe, and it wasn't safe in any country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the the notion of the diplomatic pouch comes into right. effect. Right. And probably had been for many years prior to that is we've got to have this stuff secure. The really good stuff has to be <laughs> secure because we can't put it in the regular mail. And and the British got, I'm sure some other countries do too, but the British got so good at opening mail, yeah. copying by hand, of course, the information, putting the, the 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 letter or whatever it was back into the original envelope, resealing it with seals that looked proper and getting it back into the stream so that hopefully the recipient never realized that this this has already been opened and looked at by people. You know, and it was wow. it was going to slowly move anyway. And then if they intercepted stuff that was encoded and and encryption wasn't as common as you might think, but there was right. encryption though. It went to a, a part of the post office called the deciphering branch. And so mm. if there was an agency in the British government that was a full-time, unadulterated, focused, and professional intelligence service, it was this deciphering branch wow. created originally in 1703. Mm. And uh, and so they would... Uh, it actually, it was a family of clergymen who, who <laughs> ran it for many years. Of oh, course it was. Is a side, of course it a was. side gig, you know. <laughs> But they were pretty good code breakers yeah. in, a, in the manual sense. And you've got guys up in the mass with as good at telescopes yeah. as they've got, counting ships and seeing what ships have their yards crossed. And, yeah. you know, that was a routine thing for many, many years. And then ultimately that information uh, would would transmit here and there. But but uh, they, they were in this business with all its ups and downs and yeah. all the slowness of communication. They were definitely in this business. So we talked a lot about the, about the gathering of intelligence in its different forms. And we've talked about the Navy's role also in gathering. Tell us about the benefit that our heroes and the Navy reaped generally. Are there examples of victories won or disasters avoided like the ones that we see in O'Brien's books? You know, I don't know. You might guess that there was more of that than I think there was. Yeah. Um, and again, we're, 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 we continue to be hampered with the communication piece. Yeah. You know, when, a, when, when, when ships are at sea, you can't communicate with them. Mm -hmm. And they, they can't communicate back very well. So picture Nelson zipping back and forth the entire width of the Mediterranean, yeah, yeah. trying to find the French fleet and Napoleon, uh, who they knew through various sources were up to no good and, and are, were going to do something because there was this enormous fleet assembled an enormous army put with it and have disappeared. But when he's at sea, how in the world is anybody in England or how is uh, anybody, uh, you know, in the in the fleet command uh, in Lisbon or uh, offshore from Lisbon going to get a hold of them? Well, you send out as many small ships as you can trying to hope that they get to where they're going to go. That's one of the big things about frigates, you know, the eyes yep. of the fleet obviously a frigate can do a whole lot more than than just scout and transmit information but all sh all smaller ships were used in this regard back and forth yep. nelson at one point famously says if i were to die right now and autopsy <laughs> the implication <laughs> <laughs> found engraved on my heart would be lack of frigates and, <laughs> and a big part of that is is communication issues and whatnot. 
Now, if you uh, if you have gathered information and you want it, or any sort of communication that you want to deal with, and you want to get it to higher headquarters, higher fleet commander, maybe to England, you can pickle off a small ship if you've got one, and you know where Naples is. You know where Lisbon is. Yeah. You know where uh, England is. So, so your ship can find. It's much easier to to, to go that way than it is to where in the world is yeah. an individual ship or even an individual fleet zipping around the Mediterranean or the Atlantic. That becomes a much harder problem. You know, we are so used to in modern times the notion of radios. Yeah. The notion of airplanes doing reconnaissance, let alone satellites or anything like that. It's hard to get. Well, our radios, shoot, how about cell phones are so powerful now, too, yeah, yeah. satellite phones. You know, I think young people have a hard time considering that this is an issue. As you know, a whole chapter in my book is is the problems of the commander. Yeah. Right. Whether they're, right. you know, he's got all of a as soon as he gets out of sight of his next up flag officer or out of sight of harbor, he is on his own like no army commander yeah. would ever be. Um, and has got to handle all sorts of issues. And, uh, uh, you know, this is just part and parcel of that that situation. So in order, uh, I've digressed from your question. Your question <laughs> is how how um, information that, that, say, the First Lord or probably more practically the, the First Secretary of the Admiralty would deem necessary, it would be sent to one of the major naval bases and uh, and and. Hopefully some sort of small ship would take yeah. it to the general direction of wherever you want to go. Um, uh, and hopefully it would get that information there. So you can see why a lot of actionable information wasn't particularly actionable because of the time delay. Mm. Now, sometimes it's going to be an, in good enough time, but some a lot of times it's not. But uh, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples here uh, of some things that I think were significant changers, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there were many more. But but again, when you when you think about well, you know, why didn't why didn't they get this information dispersed properly or quicker? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why. They could. Let me digress for a second. One of my one of, one thing that just intrigues me um, is after the Battle of the Saints in, in Caribbean, yeah, um, it was huge victory, huge victory, right? A little bit earlier time period, but huge victory. So the back in headquarters in, in London, we're, we're antsy. Nothing's happening down there. We don't know what's going on. Maybe the admiral just doesn't have it. Let's send out a new admiral. So the new admiral gets there right after the battle and relieves the old admiral and takes over because the old admiral's been recalled. And, and, and so he gets to show back up in England and say, well, yeah, thanks for recalling me. I've just won you this enormous battle that you didn't know about. Can't be helped. Can't be helped. Wow. Nelson was almost relieved before the Battle of the Nile. Uh, they oh. were talking about it because they didn't know what was going on and they weren't wow. sure he was getting the job done. And and I, I do discuss that in the book because, you know, one of my big case studies is, is the Nile. Yeah. But they were talking about recalling him and sending somebody else out because he just yeah. didn't know what was going on. Fortunately, that didn't happen until the battle happened and then the information got up and everybody was, you know, relieved and he gets accolades and all that kind of stuff. But the same thing could have happened to him in, in that particular regard. But there, there, there are three that I'll, I'll tell you about. Um, I think in in October of eighteen four through various sources, and we use the word multi-source intelligence in modern mm -hmm. times, and I don't think they used it back then, but they had multi-source. Somebody somebody in one of these offices, whether it's in the Secretary of State office or in the Prime Minister's office or in the Admiralty, somebody is getting bits and pieces of information and, oh, this kind of relates, you know, uh, let's put all this kind of stuff together. Well, so the British government figured out that a big Spanish treasure fleet was coming from the Americas, uh -huh, heading, yeah. heading to Spain. This is, uh, this is October of 1804 uh, that this is happening. And they basically figure out, okay, if they're coming to Spain, they're going to be in, in this general vicinity here. And, and it's going to be bringing tons of money. And, oh, by the way, we also, through our multi-sources, uh, think that when it gets there, 
the Spanish are going to declare war on us. Because right then the Spanish are not at war with Great Britain. And so the decision at a high level is that we need to intercept this fleet. We need to capture this money. We will hold it for the Spanish government, but we won't <laughs> let them have it right now. And so they do. They put together a, a squadron, uh, Captain Sir Graham Moore. Yeah. I love that name, Captain Sir Graham Moore. Is, uh, his brother was John Moore, the famous general, who oh, was okay. all, the, all the rage until he got killed. And then, then the new general that everybody raged about was uh, Arthur Wellesley. Yep. But um, uh, he sent down there with a squadron of, of uh, frigates to intercept these guys. And he is successful. They, they figure out where they're going to be and about when they're going to be. And, and, uh, and they accost them on the high seas. They fight. Of course they fight. The Spanish have to fight. You can't just say, okay, yeah. we'll, let, we'll let you have our treasure ships. Uh, one ship is blown up and the others are are captured and it's a, it's a uh, uh, an incident. Well, of course, that forces the Spanish to declare war anyway. But at least right. they don't have four million pounds of of, uh, of treasure, you know, to bankroll their uh, their uh, operations against Great Britain. By uh-huh. the way, Nelson Nelson wasn't too keen on this. He thought it was oh really a shaky thing to do. Uh, in peacetime, because we're not at war with Spain, and, and there were some other admirals, but they they supported anyway. Uh, and O'Brien it, talks. It, yeah, Go ahead. O, o, I was going to say O'Brien mentions it in in the, in the worlds of fiction. Two different fictional worlds and the world of reality overlap because in fiction, Jack Aubrey was in or nearby for that action. Sorry for yes. the spoilers for Chapter Fourteen of Post Captain. Uh, and and captain, so was yes. Horatio. So was Horatio Hornblower. Yes, right, in, right. Uh, in Hornblower and the Hotspur. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's a it's a huge famous event, but I don't think uh, I don't think either fiction writer dwells on, and we don't know the details. Right. But there was multi source clues. Yeah. yeah. That this was going to happen, and it was good enough and timely enough to get a squadron of of British ships at the right place. To, to make this happen, it's uh, it's 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 pretty serious. Another one I'll draw your attention to, and again I, I mentioned that the well I didn't know <laughs> the the Battle of the Nile is one of my case studies in the book. Right. Also, the Battle of Copenhagen in eighteen one ah. uh, is uh, do you say Copenhagen or Copenhagen? Uh, a Brit would say Copenhagen. Good. <laughs> Despite my Italian last name, my my other half I'm half Danish, and all the uh-huh. all, all of the old ladies that I remember meeting uh, uh, with my mother uh, when I was a little boy uh, stressed that you should say Copenhagen because Copenhagen is how the Germans pronounce it. Yeah, uh-huh. because uh-huh. of the war, you know, these, right. these old ladies wanted to really differentiate that. Right, so. right, right. <laughs> And, and anyway, have very much, neither has very much to do with the way a Dane would pronounce the name of the city that we're talking about. Kubenaben. Yeah, I can I think. Exactly. Nice. Some, something like that, yes. Unpronounceable. Anyway, in, in that action, I, I got to recommend uh, a book by one of our fiction writers, Dudley Pope, who did the, mm-hmm. okay. the, um, the Ramage series. Uh, he also wrote some superb history, and his book called The Great Gamble is about the whole campaign leading up to and the action of of, uh, of uh, the attack on Copenhagen, mm. uh, mostly led by Nelson. He was the number two admiral, but he's the one that went in and did it in, uh, in 1801. But it's full of bits and pieces of intelligence things of how they were figuring out what to do, what was going on, what what nuances they had to worry about. Uh, he did a nice job. It's not a book about intelligence, but it's got a lot of intelligence stuff in it. And I, I certainly recommend it. And I talk about it a bunch in, in my book too, in that case study. Speaking of Copenhagen, the, the, the other one I might mention is when the British for the second time assaulted Copenhagen in 1807, yeah. that was based, we think, on what very well was an intelligence coup and not just a diplomatic military triumph because the british learned a lot of key detail on the the russian french agreement uh between napoleon and the czar um at tilsit and remember they met on a raft in the river napoleon himself and the and the czar and they talked about things well there's there's a suspicion that there might have been a spy on the raft or there might have been a spy somewhere in that 
entourage on, on either side, or it could be that uh, um, somebody in the diplomatic structure of, of the French, because the, the, the French information was kept pretty tight. Napoleon had a, a, a he was a master of a lot of things and, and, and intelligence and, and operational planning was one of his things, but something went wrong on this one. I, I always have the feeling that in the O'Brien books that S Stephen is able to take advantage of almost supernaturally fast overland communication of news when it suits the flow of the plot. Yes, yes, or at, or sea communications. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, which exactly. which is were faster in a lot of ways, but again, other things had to be had to work out. I think you you're aware of. I think it, it, it it's in the canon, and, and it, it was a true thing, and you you see it here and there that that a ship could fly a signal saying carrying dispatches right. and no other British ship could stop them. Even, no. even you know, an admiral could not stop them because there was this recognition that, you know, if you've got something hot, you can't be stopped at all for any reason. If we're going to talk about the post office, you've got to talk about the other thing that I think most people will find surprising. The other agency that helped, uh, hugely was Lloyd's of London, which back in those days was still calling itself Lloyd's Coffee House mm. because that's how it started, yeah. um, kind of, you know, a hundred years before the time we're talking about. But again, you picture this, this, uh, and I guess you have to explain that a, a little bit. There was lots of coffee houses and various people met in different kinds of coffee houses. There was, there was one for naval officers. There was one for artists. There was one for this and that. And so a lot of the insurance guys and and guys dealing with maritime trade would hang out at Lloyd's. Um, and 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 so you saw this organization who, because of their prime business, which was having this place where 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 insurance underwriters could hang out and talk to each other and and write policies and do this and do that had to be a communications hub from all over the world. And like the post office, they had agents all over the world and in, and ships were coming in all the time and, and, and relating uh, information and ships were going out at the same time. And, and, and again, because of this highly developed communications uh, network, the, they had developed a unique system of maritime intelligence. So, Lots of information was flowing around, and they certainly shared that information with the Admiralty probably quicker than they shared it with anybody else because they were in a symbiotic relationship with the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy cut them some some favors here. So I, I was just going to say, Steve, that you'd mentioned you know going over there for Trafalgar for Nelson, and and we know that Nelson is such a hero for Jack Aubrey, and and still a huge figure in kind of the mythology of Britain and the British Navy. Would love to know your take as a historian and you know and an intelligence officer who's worked with the military on Nelson here. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's a reason that that uh, I I titled my my book um, because the full title, obviously, most secret and confidential, is is the grabber, I think. But the subtitle is Intelligence in the Age of Nelson. Well, exactly. mm. that. That subtitle is there for two reasons. Uh, it is the age of Nelson, well, you know, whether whether people in other countries like it or not. And the age of Nelson stretches beyond just him. In in my opinion, it does you, you have to you have to you have to go, you know, back a few years. Well, the age of fighting sail is kind of an equivalent term, and you, Nelson himself was a fiend for information. I mean, he right. just, Nelson was a as we say in baseball over here, he was a natural for many things, <laughs> many things. Uh, he was a good tactician. He was a good strategist. Um, and he was a good intel guy. And he used every scrap of information he could get. He analyzed it all himself. Of course, so did every other commander because there mm -hmm. were no intelligence officers in those days, uh, like we talk about in, in more modern times. There, you know, you didn't have a good, you didn't have staff experts at all like we have I mean, nowadays. If you're a shipboard commander or even if you're a fleet commander, you don't have it. So you're doing this all yourself. But he was particularly interested and he could think of nuance and in, in what wow. uh, I have a big section in, in a fairly lengthy passage in the book where 
where uh, they discover a, a, a abandoned ship and they're coming back from from Ch- <laughs> you know you talk about a, a feel for what we should do the fact mm-hmm. that Nelson took the Mediterranean fleet out of the Mediterranean all the way over to the West Indies chasing the French fleet which he didn't have ironclad proof that had gone that way but he had enough that he made this decision and then of course misses them down there and then chases them all the way back well this is in the i mean that's just a phenomenal c.s forrester one of c.s forrester's first book was life of nelson and he and he talks about this and and he's he's amazed at the, the brain power of nelson to put together that this has happened and i'm yeah. willing to stake my entire reputation i'm willing to take the fleet out of the mediterranean where yeah, it's supposed out of to be all together yeah yeah all right. together and across the atlantic this is the thought processes that went into that and then the moral courage to do it yeah you know was was uh, was phenomenal but on the way back they encounter a, a small ship and they've got they bring some clues over they can't figure out what it is and, and he he takes the evidence he thinks about it a while and then he lectures his office officers on well this is what has happened and he goes piece by piece with every little piece of information and puts together what he thinks has happened and it and and, and it turns out to be the case and it's just a wonderful shot of uh, analysis that it just talks about how he is at with that the other thing that uh, has got to be discussed is and I think that that this was not totally uncommon, and it gets back to to Stephen Matron in a way, mm. um, where 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 a, a ship captain or a, or a fleet admiral has a an expert, a diplomatic expert, maybe an intelligence expert. You probably wouldn't define that very specifically, but I think it it was. Uh, not common, but not unheard of, that, that you would have somebody on board to help this, the commander think through some things. And remember, this is a time period where seniors are not particularly culturally interested in the opinions of subordinates. Right. And subordinates right. culturally are not in the habit of offering unsolicited advice to seniors. Yeah. Well, in Nelson's case, he became aware of a fella who was a clergyman who actually had gone on the Copenhagen expedition, but he's not, he wasn't with Nelson. He was with Admiral Parker in, in the main body of the fleet. But he later on uh, gets his hands on him, so to speak. <laughs> and he becomes, he, he becomes a, a person on Nelson's staff. Now he, his name is Alexander John Scott. What he was, was a, an incredible linguist. And he had about, um, 11 languages under his belt and uh, he was very good at acquiring new languages <laughs> and so what would happen is he would often sit with Nelson in the cabin they had these matching big black chairs leather covered chairs and they would go over newspapers and they would go over letters that they had captured and he would translate for them. Nelson was insatiable in his interest in in, uh, in in all of the information it could be gleaned by then the other thing that that nelson used this guy for is he put him ashore in in uh, ports in in spain mm. and ports in in wherever that they were operating and this is the mediterranean fleet again yeah and and he would walk around as if he were just some tourist he'd be dressed in the local thing and he would just listen uh, to people talk and he would he would uh, get a feel for what was going on and what the sentiment was of of the populace and he would also collect newspapers and, and all that kind of stuff so he, he went on a bunch of missions so he wasn't really a trained intelligence officer he wasn't really an intelligence officer at all but he was an information gatherer um, he, he also sent him to to negotiate purchases of 
of uh, supplies too, <laughs> right? <laughs> like oranges and onions and and things like that. But that sounds a lot like the description of Stephen Matcher in early right. on, right? In Master and Commander, right, just right. wandering yeah. wandering around town as a local, just listening. That sounds like you where can't tell the Matcher me. story got started. <laughs> you can't tell me that O'Brien wasn't aware of this guy, and uh, uh, who knows? Right. He may have had a copy of this same yeah. biography. Yeah, uh, and and so he made Matron this guy plus more, right? And 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 he was somewhat of an eccentric fellow too, and I think he's we see some eccentricities in in Stephen Matron as well. Right. So he built he built on it, but there was a guy like this that was uh, crucially important to uh, to uh, Nelson as he tried to understand what was going on in his theater and and take every bit and piece of information that he could and turn it into. To some, I think in terms of naval officers in the time period, Nelson was exceptional in this particular subject area, as he was exceptional in in, 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 in so many other things. Um, so, yeah, I'm a I'm a fan. You know, he Nelson, had, like a lot of great people, I think he had great flaws. His personal life had had some problematic issues yeah. um, that, that hurt him professionally. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, they didn't kill him professionally, but he had a knack for, for, for uh, leadership. He had a knack for captivating people, but he also had a knack for making enemies and, and actually losing the interest of, of some people who had been uh, under his spell. And then, and yeah. then, and then not so much later on Lord St. Vincent being one of those. You did want my opinion on Nelson. Did yeah, you? yeah, right. Let's do it. right. There you go. I love <laughs> so, that. So, you know, and again, we know he's, we know he had flaws, and and, and we know, we know that. Um, but, geez, uh, don't we all? So let me well. let me quote <laughs> before we ban on this. Let me pro- quote Professor Jeffrey Marcus, who said, who wrote once, Nelson possessed characteristic qualities of instant decision, unfailing resource, unshakable tenacity of purpose brilliant tactical insight, swift and audacious action combined with an all-consuming, overmastering urge towards victory. Isn't that a hell of a statement? I love that. Wow. Yeah. I think I think it I think it's all all right on it. Rear Admiral Alfred Mahan, the American sea power guru, as you know, his his remark is no man was ever better served than Nelson by the inspiration of the hour. But no man ever counted less. Oh wow! I mm. I really like that. I really wow, like yeah. that. And then and then uh, the distinguished British historian Sir Arthur Bryant said that Nelson had an imaginative attention to detail mm. in the context of a larger statement. But I've always liked that because you know some people are good about with detail. Some people are good about the big picture, you know? Yeah, we all know was... idea men. I'm an idea man, you know? I don't know how you're going to implement this, but I'm an idea man. And then you've got guys who they can implement anything, but they don't have the idea. And, and what, I, what I took Brian uh, for saying there is that Nelson did it both. He simultaneously had the big picture, but he also, he also never gave up on, on, on detail. I mean, nice. it's just a lot rolled up into into one guy. So I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go overboard. I do have a couple really nice pictures of Nelson, <laughs> but I, but I, I don't, I don't have a shrine or anything in my house to him. But I think, I think that I think he does deserve the reputation that yeah. that we've given him. Nice. And yet, as the as the eighteen hundreds advanced and started to get more more complex and technical. Um, it, it was some ways time to let go of some Nelsonian things, not others, but some, because of just the world evolved. Yeah, the world evolved, and you had to, you 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 had to evolve uh, with it and not get stuck you know, in any particular time period. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think even Jack Aubrey at some point sort of muses to himself that the the maxim of never mind maneuvers go straight at them actually doesn't always hold for all situations. No, it doesn't. I'm glad you brought that up because that, that kills me. You, you see on all these Facebook Age of Sales sites, people yeah. like to quote that all the time. And 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 yet the reality is um, I've never been able to find, I don't have it in my quotation book, 
that he oh. actually said or wrote that. He comes wow. close to it. Yeah. But we, we know that it gets back to, to, to him evaluating every situation and dealing with every situation differently. He went straight at him at Trafalgar, but yeah. that was a calculated risk that they that the French and Spanish weren't good enough in their in their uh, right. marksmanship and their rate of fire to defeat the two columns he was sending. You know, he might not have sent two columns bows on yep. to a line of Danish ships or even a line of American ships if we had a line of American ships, which we didn't <laughs> in those days, because because the uh, the incoming fire would have been too great. But that was a, yeah. that was a calculation, and he didn't do it all the time by any no, no. he was a believer in maneuver when maneuver was correct right right and it, and it seemed like he was also trying to express his desire for his captains to command and fight independently when the fight broke down into a melee you know this thing the line about no no man can do badly wrong if he puts himself alongside a frenchman and opens fire which i think is pretty close but not the same thing it, yes but it does I'm glad you came up with that. That's one of my favorite lines as well. I don't think he actually said Frenchman, though. He was the I enemy. Think you think you're right, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but it doesn't matter because that that's the whole point. You can't do very long. And you have to have individual initiative. Yeah. And he was big on that. And, of course, his career certainly showed that. He was <laughs> he was big on individual initiative. Right, you know, right. Like, yeah, 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 he was. Right. Like turning his ship out of the line at uh, the Battle of yeah. St. Vincent, you know. Um, <laughs> it's... You, you know the famous uh, rebuttal that that Saint Vincent, Lord Saint Vincent, made to to his flag captain, who was who who thought Nelson should be censured or reprimanded for that. And says, well, if you do something similar like that in the future, I'll forgive you too. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. It was insubordination, but it was the right insubordination. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. Yeah, Under yeah, one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. absolutely. Very good. Or we or there would be no Earl Saint Vincent, and I think he was right. Uh, smart enough to realize that instantly yeah. yeah indeed 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 so steve we've heard as we've been talking here about especially from your the, the two books that we mentioned the most most secret and confidential your book about intelligence in in the age of nelson and also your your book on nelson himself tell us what else is there that we can go looking for if we want to read and hear more about your work and what what else are you up to these days what, what's coming up for steve maffeo well, um, I have, uh, I've done six books. Most Secret and Confidential was the first yeah. one. And then it was followed by the, the uh, Seas Burner Sink, which is the, the Nelsonian um, quotation book. Yeah. I'm dreadfully unhappy that the publisher decided that that should be a library book and, and it has priced it out of the reach of individual humans oh, out of the reach of most libraries it's just ridiculous and I'm, I'm very sorry because again i wrote it for guys like you and me and, and guys and gals i don't mean to, to be yeah. sexist here um who who you know if you've been intrigued by the uh, previous reading that you've done you might want to know nelson well this is not exactly a biography but but um once you page through it, and, and it, it isn't a book you just read from cover to cover, you you pick the topics. What did he think about this? What did he think about that? And you learn so much about it. And I wish it were priced decently, yeah. but it's not. Uh, then um, my third book, I stayed in the age of sale, and it is an account of um, the battle between old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, mm. and HMS Java. Um, um, it happened in December of 1812. So obviously, it's a it's a situation of the War of 1812. And I, I go back about three months, and I go with the preparation of both ships: one in Portsmouth, England; the other in in Charlestown, Massachusetts, Boston, essentially. And what their missions were, and, and all their difficulties, and and trials and tribulations. And they get out to sea. They do this, that, and the other thing until they ultimately find each other accidentally off the coast of Brazil. So then uh, my uh, my next book was, uh, I, I jumped very far into the 20th century and I did a biographical dictionary of 59 famous U.S. Navy intelligence officers, linguists, and huh. code breakers working okay. against Japan starting in 1910. Um, and, and this was a major focus up yep. until and through the, through the war. 
Um, wow. And and so uh, I'm very proud of that one. Although again, publisher decides it should only be in libraries and, and charges oh. huge money for it, which is just very disappointing. Uh, the next one was uh, oh, the old Ironsides book is semi-fictional. I have to mm. say that I made up I made up conversations and and uh, but every character is true, every event is true. Mm. But it was like one of my writing mentors said: the second you do something fictional, the whole thing is now fiction. It's like becoming slightly pregnant. You just that's not yeah, you're right, either are or you're not right. So um, I'm very proud of that book. It's, it's in a it's a it's entertaining, but it's also if you want to know the story of old Ironsides and the Java, it there's nothing else out there right. like that. And so uh, my fifth book is about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hmm. Um, the Soviets sent down four Foxtrot submarines that carried one each nuclear tipped torpedo, which which they typically did not do. And they were prosecuted unmercifully by the US Navy during the, the event, not knowing we didn't know for 40 years that those guys had nuclear weapons. Wow. And we prosecuted the hell out of them. And one of the captains about has a nervous breakdown right. and decides he's not going to wait to be killed. 300 feet under the water when the Americans decided it was going to be a hot war. Um, and he decided he was going to shoot the, the nearby U.S. Navy aircraft carrier and, and with his nuclear weapon. And he was barely talked out of it by a uh, equal rank commander on board the ship as a passenger. Yeah. Barely talked out of it. Barely talked out wow. of it. So you think mm. the Cuban Missile Crisis was scary. It was scarier than, than you think. And again, um, I'm very proud of it. It's a it's a heck of an accurate historical thing, but I had to make up some stuff, and so therefore, because it's slightly pregnant, it's a, it's class description, but uh, <laughs> but it's nothing. Then my last one was was a a, a biography of a of an old U.S. Navy aviator that I knew a long time ago, who had gotten a Navy Cross, which is the second highest award you can get in the Navy. Um, for uh, flying a torpedo bomber in the Battle of Leyte Gulf in uh, oh yeah in 1944, and uh, and so um, I had some great sources on this, and and uh, like I say, it's a biography of him, but it's also he's a Denver guy, he's a Denver guy. Mm. <laughs> it's also uh, a, a pretty good account for what uh, the USS Lexington um, did from uh, for several months while he was on board, and culminating in. The, in the Battle of Lake Haley. So, um, Very good. so that's out there. That came out about a year and a half ago. My next book uh, is probably going to be a biography of uh, the American naval officer who was the father of naval cryptology. Ooh. Uh, he deserves a biography. Lawrence Safford is his name. He deserves a biography and hasn't had one done. And strangely, his paper papers are in the the University of Wyoming at Laramie, just up the highway from me. Oh, wow. I fancy that. Good stuff. And, uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, because of that and because he deserves it, and, and, and I already have about 30 pages of him in that book I told you about that I had done the biographical dictionary code breakers and whatnot. So I've already got a start on it. That's probably going to be my next one. Steve, this has been really, really great. Thank, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you both so much for spending time with the listeners and guiding our future reading uh, into so many fascinating new directions. We really appreciate your time. Um, we hope you've had a good time too. And, uh, and thank you once again for joining us on The Lover's Hole. I've had a wonderful time. And I, uh, I really appreciate you, uh, you asking me. I, I feel very, very honored. Um, it's not often that I get to talk to people uh -huh. about these subjects that are so near and dear to my heart. And so uh, this is a, this is a wonderful opportunity. And by the way, by the way, uh, most secret and confidential is, is available on Amazon and it's available on Amazon UK. It's out of print and, and they may exhaust supplies. And so I will say this, I have, a pretty big box of hard copy with oh. nice book jackets. And I am willing to let them go for free if people will pay the postage. Now, postage in the U.S., I haven't done this for a while, might be 6 or $7. Postage to the U.K. is going to be a lot more. But I offer this. And so maybe you could share with the people my email. And Very happy uh, anybody who would, would want to do that, and I would, of course, autograph the books. 
but nice. um, they should be they should be available, uh, paperback or hardbound, either with Amazon yeah. or Amazon UK. But that's yeah. that's an offer. That's an offer. Right. Well, <laughs> and you've got Kindle on Amazon as well, which you know is not going to run out. Thank goodness. I hope. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully that's true. Right. Thank you, Steve. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, wasn't that great, you know, to yeah. hear more about the real world of intelligence back in our heroes' times. We had thought that we'd learned that Stephen's intelligence gathering was pretty much made up for this story. But for sure, you know, O'Brien took some license with the Organization of British Intelligence. Right. But not completely. Exactly. That that connection to Nelson's intelligence advisor was really fascinating. And it sounded a lot like maybe Stephen could have had an, an even more of a real-world counterpart than we'd previously thought. So that was just fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, we don't want to get too far away from our story because we've got a lot of intelligence work going on here. Yeah. Let's remember that when we come back next week, we're at that exciting point in Post Captain with a duel in the offing, you know, a duel between our two heroes. Right. New and apparently catastrophic orders from Admiral Hart leading to a dash across the channel to harass the French invasion fleet if Jack and the Master can find them amid the shoals and the tides and the enemy batteries waiting for them. Oh my gosh, you're reminding me, Mike. This book is absolutely on a knife edge. I can't wait. What do you say next week then to just a little bit more of Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. (laughs) 